It's time for us to check back in with Alex Stewart and see what happens next. If you've missed any of the previous readings, please look in the description below for a playlist. Alex, I know you've bought them thousands of chairs, including several dozen for me. Some folks spend a day or two putting a bottom in a chair. How long did it take you to put a good white oak or hickory bottom in a chair? There was a little log church up here on Blackwater, and the only seats they had was chairs. They was 24 of them that didn't have bottoms in them. Old man Alder, he was sort of the boss over it. He asked Pap would he bottom them chairs. Pap agreed. Well, we worked a day or two getting all the splits ready, and Pap says to me one morning, let's go over there and put the bottom in those chairs for that old man. All them chairs was setting out back of the church house. We had mostly white oak splits, but we had some hickory bark too. I went down to a feller's house and borrowed a dish pan to put water in so we could soak the bark and splits. We bottomed them 24 chairs in one day, and we went up to the old man's house late in the day, and he said, well, how'd you get along? Pap said, very well, I guess. We got them all done. He said, well, I'll be dogged. And he got up and went down there and looked for himself. He just couldn't believe that we'd bottomed all them chairs in one day. He said, I swear that's an extra good job. And he give Pap a little money and a half a side of meat. Now that's how long it took us to bottom chairs. There was an old colored man who lived over there and he followed bottoming chairs. I was over there one day and he was bottoming chairs for Jim Stewart. That was Alex's uncle, great uncle. I got tired of watching him. I finally said, Willie, if you don't care, I think I'll try bottoming one of them chairs for you. He sort of talked through his nose, says, go right ahead, go right ahead. So I got one down and had a bottom in it long before he finished his. He wasn't half done when I finished. He said, upon my honor, that beats anything ever I seed. I wish I could do that. I said, well, you can if you work your hands fast enough. You've got to keep your hands a-going. Do you ever use poplar bark for bottoming chairs? Yeah, I've bottomed with poplar bark. It's pretty good, but it won't last like hickory. They ain't nothing that beats hickory. If hickory is peeled at the right time, I'll guarantee it'll last 50 years. Poplar won't last that long? Oh no, it won't last half as long. It gets dry and breaks. What else did you use? Well, you can use lin bark and pawpaw bark and iron elm. Red elm makes a pretty good chair bottom. Now shucks from corn makes a good chair bottom, but it's so tedious to work with. I never fooled with it much. When is the best time to get hickory bark? You want to get it just when the sap starts to rise enough that you can peel it. If you let all the sap rise before you peel it, then your bark will be rotten, too much sap. Then you can wait till later in the year when nearly all the sap's gone, and that's another good time to peel it. Sometimes you can peel it on the new moon in April, but generally you have to wait till the new moon in May. After the new moon in June, you can't peel it at all. Now there's seven different kinds of hickory around here, and not all of them has bark that will work for bottoming chairs. Tell me about your chair making. Well, we're both sitting in chairs I made over 70 years ago, and as far as I can tell, they're as good as the day I made them. They've been used every day, and they got some pretty rough treatment along the way with all the children. I bought several hundred metal chairs a couple of years ago, and many of them are falling apart already. How were you able to build chairs so much stronger and durable than factory-made ones without glue or nails? First, you want to get the right kind of timber. Cut it at the right time and place, and then season it right. Not too fast or it'll crack. I'd use green post, and I would season the rungs as much as I could, and when you put them rungs in the post, then the green post will cure out and clamp them rungs just like they growed there. Now, hackberry makes the finest chairs ever was. When it's green, you can take and bend the post and the slats, and they'll stay bent. It's a light wood, yet it's strong. Generally, people used maple for the post and oak for the rungs and slats. 
That's what I made most of mine from. Old Man Miller, he tried to buy some of my chairs the other day, and I told him, No, I made them when I started housekeeping, and they've lasted me up till now. I know they're going to last me as long as I need them, and then some. How long did it take you to make a chair, and how much did you get paid for it? If I had all my timber, I could make a chair frame in one day, and if I had my bark or splits, I could bottom it that night. I'd get 50 cents a piece for them delivered. If you took into consideration your time gathering the timber, as well as your labor, you were making very little. On the average, I'd make 25 cents or maybe 30 cents a day, but that was pretty good money back then. How many chairs would you say you've made? I'd guess I've made between 500 and 1,000. I never kept count. A while ago, you said you had never made a freight train nor a ship. How about boats? Did you ever make a boat? Boats? Oh, I've made many a boat. I learned boat making from my uncle. He lived on the river and followed fishing, and he made his own boats. I made several for myself, and one day, Milt Wilson come by and wanted me to make him a boat. Well, I got my timber and put right in on it, and in about a week, I had it finished. Charged him $10. He liked it so well, he told other people about it, and before long, I was in the boat business. I made 13 boats that one summer. How did you make them tight enough so they wouldn't leak? I used poplar. Take a tree that's about 18 inches through, and that will make planks 14 inches wide. You can't have many knots. A knot will crack, and then you've got a leak. Now, in making boats, you don't want your timber too well seasoned. If it's too dry, then when you put it in the water, it will swell too much, and it will buck out. You want your timber about half seasoned. I made my boats from 16 to 20 feet long. After I got one made, you could take and put it in the river, and the first two or three days, it would leak a little. You could take and dip that water out, and it would never leak another drop as long as you kept it in the water. Oh, at one time, a heap of the fishing boats up and down this river was ones I'd built. I never had no kick about a boat I made. One hot day when Alex and I were sitting on his front porch, the conversation lulled momentarily. I had no particular question to ask, but noticed a horse down near his barn. A simple question or two was all that was needed to spark a dissertation on breaking horses. Is that your horse down there? Horse? It's a mare, I think, down there in the pasture. Is that yours? No, that belongs to Rick. That was Alex's grandson. We've got a mule down there, got a dandy mule, plow our tobacco with it. Did you ever break any horses and mules? Oh, broke many a one. Are they much trouble to break? Well, it's a whole lot of trouble if you don't understand horse nature. Every horse ain't nature to like. I went to a sale over here on Blackwater and bought a mule. Give $50 for him, harness, check lines, and all. There was a terrible big crowd, and nobody didn't bid much on him, and they knocked him off on me. I thought there was something wrong with that mule, or he wouldn't have went for no such price as that. And as I got about ready to leave, there was two fellers come up to me, and one of them says, Now I'm going to tell you something. You watch that mule. He'll kill you. Said, it took seven of us to shoe him, and he wants to go to the barn with you every time you get out and work him. When it goes to getting hot, he'll go to the barn with you in spite of everything you can do. I thinks to myself, that's awful encouraging. But I said, I'm glad you come and told me the way he was. I come on home, and the next day I put the gears, the harness, on him and took him back in the ridge there to cut firewood. I cut me down two or three great big blackjacks about 30 feet long. I hooked him to one and got started. He run a little piece, and here he come right back on me and almost backed over me. He commenced kicking, and when he quit, I just tied my lines to a bush to where he couldn't get away. Then I cut me a pole about six or eight foot long, about as big as my arm. I come back and called on him again, and here he come again, right back over me, kicking and rearing. 
I took and let him have it with that pole around the side of his head with both hands. It knocked him down, and he laid there with his eyes rolling. I thought surely I'd killed him. He laid there a few minutes, and I called on him, and he got up. He stood there and trembled just like a leaf. I called to him, and he struck right out and hauled that load to the house. I went back and hauled two or three more loads before I let him out. He never showed another trick. Everybody wanted to know what I'd done to him. They said that mule couldn't be broke. They was a feller come here one day a looking at him and asked me if I would sell him. I said, I'll take $150. He said, well, I've just bought your mule. He took that mule home and worked him a day or two and come to me and said he couldn't do a thing with him. I give him his money back and took the mule back. He couldn't do nary a thing with the mule. Did you ever break any oxen? Yeah, I broke many of them. I broke them from the time they were six months old on up till they got to be great big ones. They're not too bad to break. I'd rather break a steer any time than to break a horse. I've plowed corn, snaked timber, and done all kinds of work with steers. If you put them on level ground, nothing can pull out a good steer, but they don't do so well pulling uphill. They have to pull using their weight, and they can't do that very well when they're going up a grade. You want to start breaking cattle when they're yearlings and load them according to how fast they grow. Don't load them too heavy. When you're breaking a young team of steers like that, you have to make a new yoke every once in a while as they grow. I had a pair of oxen, and we didn't work them very much. They finally got to where they just start off, and you couldn't stop them. How do you control them without a bridle or anything? Well, you just got to learn them that. You put what they call a G-string on them. If they start, you can sure learn them to stop. If one wants to run with you too much, just put a rope on him, first around his forelegs and then around his withers toward his back. When he starts to run, just pull that rope a little and you'll jab his nose in the dirt every time and he'll soon quit that. I suppose you doctored livestock too and castrated them. Why, Lord, yeah, I've cut many a brute. I learned it from my dad. He was a good stock doctor. Old man Mathis lived right down the road here, and he had five or six bull calves. They was awful pretty ones, weighed 400 or 500 pounds apiece. They was getting up big enough for service, and he said, I've been wanting them changed castrated for a long time. I just don't know anybody around here that does that. I said, well, if you want me to, I'll change them for you. He drove them up in the barn and he said, are you going to throw them down? I said, no, you tie him to where he can't get away and I'll show you what I'll do to him. He tied his head up to the wall good and I just went over there, grabbed him by the sack and pulled it right down to where he couldn't kick me and I stood there and trimmed him standing up. Jess said, well, I'll be doggoned. I always seed them throwed. Well, I said, that's foolishness. Throwing them is liable to hurt them. Did you ever put anything on them? No, never put a thing on them. Just trim them and let them go. All that blood will drop and drain out before it closes up, and they do better not to put nothing on them. If you trap that blood up in there, that's what causes them to swell up. Now, if you don't trim them right, or if you trim them at the wrong time of the moon, and if they have trouble later on, then you need to doctor them. You can take and peel buckeye bark and boil it down and bathe them in it. Another thing that's good is dishwater. Bathe them in that and it will cure them if anything will. You needn't worry about them kicking you and them sore like that. They're not going to kick nary a thing. I guess you've castrated a lot of hogs, huh? Yeah, I've took many a ball off of hogs. Now, there's a time to do that. If you've got a male hog and want him changed, don't never cut him if he's been to a sow in the last two or three days and cut him when the signs of the moon leaves the hips going down to the feet and you'll never have a bit of trouble in the world with him. Don't never trim them while the signs are in the heart and the head. If you do, he's liable to bleed to death or swell up. 
When I lived on Miss Mullins' place, she had six fine boars, and she had a feller to trim them at the wrong time of the moon. I told her when he left, I said, Now, Miss Mullins, I don't want to dishearten you none, but you're sure going to have trouble with them hogs. She said, Why? What do you mean? I said, He's trimmed them at the wrong time of the moon. The signs are in the heart and the head, and they'll be a month getting well, if they get well at all. Sure enough, three of them hogs died, and the others had a tough time. Some people used to eat the testicles, mountain oysters they call them. Oh, they're good. Didn't you ever eat them? That's one of the best things you ever eat. They have a tough skin on the outside, and you have to take that lining off, put them in salt water for a day or so, and then fix them. And if you don't tell me, they're good. Oh, I can eat every one of them I get a hold of. Mountain oysters. Historians in writing about pioneer products almost always mention beeswax as an important commodity. Did you ever make any? Oh yeah, I'd say. I've made beeswax. You take the comb out of honey and pine rosin and put it in water and boil it. Then let it cool down a little and all that wax will come to the top. You can just lift it off and make any shape out of it you want to. That pine rosin makes it a heap better. Did you have to get all the honey out of the comb in order to make beeswax? No, the honey don't hurt anything. When honey gets hot, it evaporates and it's gone. It don't help none. You can't sweeten nothing hot with honey. It'll just evaporate and be gone. What was beeswax used for? Oh, it was good for all kinds of things. You can put a good coat of beeswax on your shoes and you can wade water all day and your feet will never get wet. Your shoes will last twice as long if you wax them with beeswax once in a while. About once a week, Grandpap would take and melt a batch of beeswax and give his boots a good saturation. He never had no wet feet. You can use it on your harness or any kind of leather. In making shoes, you coated your string in beeswax so they wouldn't rot and let your shoes come apart. I remember that my grandmother and even my mother kept some beeswax to coat the bottoms of their irons when they ironed clothes. Oh yeah, they always used it for that, and it was the very thing for grafting. When you grafted an apple tree, peach tree, or whatever, you'd coat it with beeswax. I grafted many a tree like that, learned that from Grandpap and Pap too. Sam's a good hand at grafting, too. He's got a tree over his house that he's grafted, and it bears five different kinds of fruit. If you ever had a pot, bucket, or pan that leaked airy bit, you could sure stop it with beeswax. Just melt it down and put it in the hole, and it would harden just like cement. That would be the end of your leak. Was there a, a market for beeswax? Yeah, you could sell it at the stores. I've sold many a pound for 10 cents, and it takes an awful big hunk of beeswax to weigh a pound. It's light. The price went up, and it finally got up to a dollar a pound, and then it sort of went out of style, and I guess they finally quit buying it at all. You mentioned the importance of beeswax in making shoes. I don't think I ever asked you whether or not you made shoes. I've made two pair in my life out and out. The first pair I made for myself, and the second pair I made for a boy named Rick Miser. He was just a little old ragged thing, barefoot, and his feet so sore, rusty, and scaly, he couldn't hardly go. He's a great old big boy, and he never had a pair of shoes on his feet. His pap got a hold of some leather somewhere and asked me could I make his boy a pair of shoes. I went and borrowed the last and some tools from Grandpap and made that boy a pair of shoes. Oh, he was the proudest boy that ever you saw. Could you buy shoes at the store? In the early days, you never heard of store-bought shoes in this country. If you didn't have somebody to make your shoes, you just had to do without them. They was a lot of women that never had no shoes. They'd wrap rags around their feet, or sometimes they'd use deer skins. They called them moccasins. They'd skin a rabbit sometimes and line them. The first store-bought shoes that come in were called brogans, and the first women's shoes, they was just straight, narrow-toed shoes, and if you got them airy bit wet and let them dry, 
they would get hard as a rock. You had to warm them up before you could get them on. I assume the leather for shoe making and for other purposes had to be tanned locally. Did you ever tan hides and skins? Yeah, I used to tan squirrel hides, groundhog hides, coon hides, law with the hides I've tanned. I used to burn hickory and white oak mostly to make my ashes for tanning. I'd bury my hide in the ground, cover it over with them ashes, and wet it down till it was right soupy. I'd let it set 24 hours and then take it up and the hair would come right off. Then I'd go to a good stream of water and wash it good, then put it in a tub of water for another 24 hours to make sure all the lye from the ashes was out. Now after you get all the lye washed out of your hide, you'd hang it up and let it dry for a day or so. Let it get about half dry, not too dry. I used to help Uncle Campbell Sharp tan hides, and the biggest job I thought was what he called working the hide. Oh yeah, it's got to be worked. That's the most important thing. I'd saw them back and forth across the back of a chair, keep working, twisting, and sawing it. And when you worked it till it was completely dry, it would be just as soft as a rag. If you let it dry out before you worked it, it would be as stiff as a board, and you never would be able to do anything with it. I suppose there were many uses for these hides once they were tanned. Oh yes, you could make a pair of shoestrings out of a good groundhog hide, and they would wire out any pair of shoes that you ever saw. Coon hides make good shoestrings. A lot of people use squirrel hide, but they wouldn't last as long. I used to mend shoes for my family, and people got to bringing me their shoes, ripped open and coming apart, and I'd take groundhog strings and sew them up for them. Back then, people would keep patching their shoes just as long as they could hold them together. I've used groundhog hides to make banjo heads, but cat hides is the best. We make wangs, leather thongs, to sew harness with. Oh, tanned hides come in handy for a lot of things. You'd find a use for them might near every day. Did you tan hides without removing the hair? Yeah, but you don't want to use lye or ashes if you want to leave the hair on. You take your hide and wet it good and sprinkle it with alum. Roll it up and let it set for 24 hours. Then unroll it, wash it good, and get all that alum out. Then you work it till it's good and dry. You can tan a deer hide like that and it makes a good rug. There used to be a lot of groundhogs over here on Blackwater when I lived there, and an old lady, Mary Bell, lived right close. One day she said, you catch one of them big groundhogs and tan his hide and I'll make you a pair of gloves. Well, it wasn't but a few days till I catched a big one, tanned his hide and took him to Mary. She made me a pair of gloves out of that and doggone I like to have never wore them out. I wouldn't take nothing for a good pair of groundhog gloves if I had them now. Alex, you remember the old Trent place down here on the river? They say that it was the home of the ancestors of Senator Mark Hatfield of Oregon. Well, I found an old bark grinding mill there and was told that it was used to grind bark for making tannic acid for tanning heavy hides. That was old Bill Trent, Margie's great uncle, that run that tan yard. Yeah, I can remember that old mill and tan yard when it was in operation. He'd take and grind his tan bark, chestnut oak generally, with a mule or an ox. He'd put that ground up bark in a pond that he made in a little stream. Then he'd put his hides in, and they called that the ooze. You had to leave your hide in that ooze for 90 days. He'd put lime in it too, but not too much. Then he'd take the hide out and scrape the flesh side with a big, long scraper that looked a lot like a drawing knife. You can't buy leather today as good as that was. He was particular and didn't want kids hanging around there too much, but I'd go down there sometimes and just sanko around and look it over. That pond would be full of cow hides. Your talk of tanning hides and skins remind me that I was going to ask you about the various ways you hunted and trapped game. I started out hunting with a crossbow and sometimes with a bow and arrow. I got to where I was pretty good at killing rabbits, groundhogs, and things like that with a crossbow, 
and I made deadfalls. Tell me about the deadfalls. I understand it's one of the oldest forms of killing animals. Well, you take a big, thin, flat rock, four or five feet wide and about as long, and stand one end up off the ground about two feet and prop it up with a stick. Then you get a bone of some kind, a green bone, and char it right good so it'll stink. That puts off a terrible odor, and a fox can smell it for a mile. You take and put that bone under the rock on your trigger, and when that varmint undertakes to pull that bone off, he trips the trigger, and that rock will come down right on top of him. That would sure hold him. A deadfall is about the only way the Melungeons had of catching game. If they couldn't find the right kind of rock, they'd make a deadfall out of heavy poles. I used to help Grandpa Stewart make pole deadfalls. I've laid off to make me one, but I can't get out to do nothing. Now, a deadfall is dangerous about catching dogs, and I never like to use them too much. I trapped mostly with steel traps, box traps, and snares, and when I got me a rifle, I used it a heap. But I've used about every way you can think of to catch varmints, and I've hunted and trapped for every kind of animal that was around here. We were sitting on the porch one day, and I noticed a molehill in the yard. Since the conversation had lulled, I asked Alex about moles. This question, like many, brought a radiance to his face and a chuckle which told me that the subject reminded him of some long-ago incident. Now, if moles are bothering you and you want to get shed of them, you can take a cow's horn and put it in their route, and you can catch every last one of them. They go inside the big end of the horn, and they'll just keep working forward trying to get through that horn. They'll be there till they die or until you go take them out. They don't think about backing up. I learned that from my granddaddy. He knowed which way they traveled most of the time, and that's the way he'd face the horn. We'd go back every once in a while and empty that horn until we'd catch every last mole around here. Were mole skins worth anything? I got a dollar fifty for moleskin one time, and that's the most ever I heard of a moleskin bringing. I was walking across the ridge there, and I saw where a mole was rooting in the dirt. He was making a hill as big as my arm, and I got a stick and slipped up on him and got him out. He was a great big old blue thing. He was three times as big as a regular mole. I sat right down and skinned him and took him to my uncle. He sort of dealt in fur, and he gave me a dollar and a half for that skin. Did you ever trap quail? There's several ways to catch a quail. You can make you a box out of a little round poles about two foot square and just find you a smooth place on the ground and turn your box upside down. Go out from your box two or three feet and dig you a trench about three or four inches deep right on up under that box. Sprinkle you some cane seed in the trench and under the box. Them quail will start eating them seed and they'll keep going in that trench right on under that box and when they realize they're trapped, they all start flying up and fluttering around and they never think to look down and go out the way they come in. I went down to check my bird trap one time and I had nine partridges in it. Every time one would stick his head out a crack, I grabbed him and pinched it off. I took them to the house and made dumplings and gravy out of them, and I thought that was the best eating I ever eat. In the mid 1700s, Dennis D I D E R O T Duro, the noted French philosopher and encyclopedist, made drawings of netted fish traps illustrating how they were made. I had never encountered this type net anywhere until I started finding them along the Clinch River in Hancock County near where Alex lived. Years after I found the first one, I got around to querying Alex about the making and the use of the nets. Alex, you told me that you made netted fish traps. Oh yeah, he chuckles. I've made many a one. You take a hickory sapling and split it and make your hoops. The first one at the throat is about two feet across, and the next one is a little smaller on down to where the last one is not near as big. You take little blocks of wood, and you do your knitting around that. You cover the hoops with your net and make two V-shaped traps inside. One time, I went to check my net, and I had catched 
53 catfish in one net, and every one weighed at least two pounds. They was channel cats. I took them down to Gene Levesey's, and he said, that's the most fish ever I see that come out of one net. Another time I caught three big yellow cats. Two of them weighed 52 pounds each and the other weighed 48 pounds. They ain't many people around here who has caught more fish than I have. I followed it a long time and if I couldn't catch them one way, I'd catch them another. What other methods did you use in catching fish? Well, I've used trot lines a heap, and of course we stained, gigged, and speared them. Then in later years, I used reels. I dynamited them a few times, but I saw what it was doing killing all them little fish, and I soon quit that. I don't believe in that. Tell me about gigging fish. I run into Albert Lewis one day, and he was telling me that the fish had started shoaling down there in the river where he lived. We decided to go gigging. I went out in the woods the next day and got me some good, rich pine knots, split them up in splinters, and made two big torches. That night, we went down to the river, and I give him one of them pine torches, and he took one side of the river, and I took the other. Them torches give off plenty of light, and I could gig one might near every time I throwed my gig. When we were quit, I had four more than he did, and he said, I swear you're the first feller that ever beat me gigging. Me and a feller by the name of Miller was fishing right down here in the river, and I caught one that weighed about five pounds. When I come out with it, I noticed it looked a little bit odd. We got to looking at it and found it didn't have an eye in its head. It was just as smooth all around its head and had no sign of an eye. Now, if I didn't have proof of that, I wouldn't tell it. It had no symptom of an eye in its head. That learnt me that fish has to smell as well as see. Otherwise, this one couldn't have found his food nor got around. Another fascinating peek into the life of Alex Stewart. Talk about a jack of all trades. He could just do anything. Amazing the talents that he had. Uh, now in this part of the book we find out he was also able to take care of animals when they needed to be castrated. He was able to break horses and oxen. He was able to skin animals and sell the skin or make things from the skin. He could actually do the tanning. Amazing, amazing. Well, I think that Alex is remarkable uh, and, and probably ahead of so many people, especially because of the craft stuff about being able to bottom the chairs and, and make the chairs and make the vessels. All that was d definitely a specialty. Some of the other things, I think, was probably fairly common in those days because it had to be. There had to be somebody that knew how to do that to survive. You know, their very survival depended on it, whether it was how to, how to catch a bunch of fish at one time uh, with the netting or the basket and, and also the gigging. Or if it was how to take care of your animals, you know, you need to take care of them. I, I find it really interesting, you know, the part, it's kind of hard to read about him knocking the horse down, um, or the mule, although it did break it, and then it done what Alex wanted it to do. But then also how he kind of, you know, he don't believe in, like, the dynamite part. He realized that's too dangerous. So it's funny, you can see both sides of it. And probably in his older age, uh, as happens with lots of us, you look at things differently than you did when you were young and just in the middle of it and trying to get things done. Um, but fascinating. I love the part about the... Uh, in the very beginning when they're talking about the chairs is that those were the chairs they were sitting in was the ones that he had made 70 years ago. I love old stuff, but I love um, I love the, the stories that go with them. Like, you know, the man offered to buy them and he's like, no, those are the ones I made when I was first housekeeping and, and they'll be here when I'm gone. I'm not going to sell them. So I love that. I love the story of it of things, you know, that I have that was grannies or paps or whoever. But I also love the... Um, functionality and the lastingness, how they last, how the, the durability, I guess is what I'm looking for. I love how durable things like that were. Those are the kind of things I love um, and happen a lot of times to be old things. They're durable. That's just how, uh, sadly, how our society or how the manufacturing process or whatever because, and it has to be because for people to afford it and also to do it on such a large scale because there's so many more people. But I really love that, that they were sitting in those, those same old chairs that Alex had made. 
I found that part about the hackberry tree interesting. I asked Matt uh, when I noticed it as I was going over this chapter or this part of the book uh, if he knew what a hackberry tree was. He said, no, but I've heard of it. And I said, well, I don't even think I've ever heard of it, which I had to have heard of it when I wrote, read the book the first time, but I must have forgot about it. So that was interesting, talking about that tree that was so common that they used it so much, but then I don't know what it is, you know, and I'm the same trees would be... Um, near me that are near was definitely near Alex so I thought that part was interesting and then the mole who would ever have skinned a mole I can't even imagine so that part was just kind of crazy on it on that um, just totally crazy and and that was such a process in those days to skin things of course some people still do that they still there's still those kind of operations but again in those days they needed it they needed it whether it was for a pair of gloves or a pair of shoes or whatever it was for, they it was really an, um, a necessity that they use every part of the animal they harvested. So, it, for instance, if they harvested a deer, they'd not only use the meat, they would use the hide too. Uh, really, really an interesting peak though in days gone by and uh, just miraculous how many different skills Alex Stewart had. It's just amazing. So I hope you enjoyed this part of the book. Please leave a comment and tell me what jumped out at you about it. And as always, I hope you drop back by next Friday because we've got to see what happens next to Alex Stewart.